so I have the exciting uh, the task of uh, making GST uh, exciting for you guys. Um, I know uh, a lot of you guys have probably uh, dealt with these issues um, over the last couple of years. Um, I'm going to be talking about GST ITCs as they relate to holding companies. So, uh, what I'll, and I'll start off by obviously talking about what the current landscape is um, with respect to this topic, uh, what the general rules are for claiming ITCs, what the relieving rules are for uh, claiming ITCs, and then what, what some of the court cases, the relevant court cases, especially one that came out uh, in February this year. So if some of you remember, about two years ago, I presented on the same topic. Um, over the last couple of years, uh, the CRA has, going hard, has been going hard after uh, holding companies and their GST claims. I'm sure a lot of you guys are in this situation whereby they're effectively denying the ITCs by holding companies. So what it really comes down to, to make a long story short, it, it comes down to a difference in the interpretation of the legislation under the Excise Tax Act. Um, and I'll elaborate on the, what the legislation is later on. But um, basically, the CRA has a much narrow, narrower interpretation of it versus what um, tax practitioners and taxpayers have been going with. So just to kind of start off a little bit, to kind of give you guys a little bit um, of a flavor of how the GST rules work. Um, under the general ITC rules, so this is really what most companies rely on. So if you think of like a manufacturing company, for example, they predominantly rely on these general ITC rules for claiming ITCs, and usually it's not an issue in those particular situations. So as many of you know, GST registrants can claim ITCs to the extent that they are engaged in commercial activities. Um, so oftentimes we get a, the question of, well, what is a commercial activity? Uh, commercial activity is really just any business carried on by the corporation, but it specifically excludes uh, what we call exempt transactions or exempt activities. Um, and again, people always ask, well, what the heck is you know, an exempt activity? You know, in, in, a, in a normal context, if you think of like the rent that you pay to your landlord, you know, if you're renting an apartment, that's actually considered an exempt supply. So uh, long-term rent to individuals, um, that's an exempt supply. So you don't obviously pay GST on your rent. And conversely, the landlord cannot actually claim ITCs relating to their rental property. You know, in a, in a business context, one of the most common ones and which really affects the holding companies is um, financial services. So financial services are considered an exempt supply. And so when I say financial services, what I really mean is like, you know, a company that loans funds and buys and sells shares, that would be considered an exempt supply. Um, and under the general ITC rules, uh, you cannot actually claim any ITCs. So if you, if you look, if you kind of think of those general ITC rules in the context of, you know, the, the way Canadian publicly, public companies are, are, are structured, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have this similar structure, you have a Canadian public company, um, you know, it's traded, for example, on the TSX, um, that has foreign, uh, a foreign subsidiary with foreign operations, for example, in mineral exploration. So a lot of times what happens is the Canadian company will get its financing, obviously from the investors, and then loan those funds down to the foreign subsidiary for, for its operations uh, overseas, for example. So if you think of those general ITC rules that I just talked about, um, if the holding company is truly a holding company and does, it has nothing else on its balance sheet other than the shares of the foreign subsidiary, it can't claim ITCs because it's actually providing financial services. It's in the business of loaning funds to the subsidiary and effectively just holding shares. So, you know, years ago, what ended up happening is the Canadian government got a lot of pushback and, and people said, well, it doesn't make sense that all I'm doing is interposing a Canadian holding company uh, to hold the shares of the foreign subsidiary and I'm not actually able to claim ITCs. That doesn't make sense. Um, you know, for business purposes, we've structured it that way, but that should not prevent us from claiming ITCs. Uh, the government, the Canadian government heard people and said, that's fine, that makes complete sense. We'll allow the holding companies to claim ITCs in certain circumstances. Um, so in order to claim those ITCs by holding companies, uh, those, the expenditures incurred by the holding company uh, need to effectively relate to the underlying subsidiary. Um, and uh, more importantly, perhaps, uh, the subsidiaries uh, activities, well, they need to be engaged in commercial activities. So if you think, kind of look at those rules, it's basically a look-through rule. And effectively, if the subsidiary is engaged in commercial activities and those expenses relate to that subsidiary, uh, the holding company can claim those ITCs. So 
if you if you if you kind of think about you know those relieving rules and then you counter that with what the CRA has been uh, saying are eligible ITCs, you can only imagine that it's quite different. Uh, so the CRA actually has a bulletin whereby they go through uh, what they consider to be eligible ITCs for holding companies. And again, as you can imagine, the the, the interpretation is quite narrow. Um, so some of the examples, for example, are accounting and legal services on the acquisition of additional shares or on the sale of the subsidiary shares. Um, and if you look at that last point, uh, in certain circumstances, they'll allow administrative overhead to be claimed by the holding company. Um, and I can tell you right now, because I look at a lot of these claims, um, the CRA almost never allows administrative overhead, no matter how much you say it's attributable to the underlying subsidiary. So just to kind of give you guys an idea of the way, you know, because I know uh, all of us like to see how it looks like on, on, on a chart, um, you have the parent company who is usually a Canadian company uh, that's publicly traded. Uh, the operating company is oftentimes, um, you know, not Canadian. So in this example, it's a U.S. resident corporation. And the U.S. resident corporation is usually carrying on some type of a commercial activity. So what ends up happening is the parent company being in Canada, usually it's Vancouver based for example, they'll incur a substantial amount of professional fees uh, and obviously have GST attached to those professional fees. And so what ends up happening is, and again I'm sure a lot of you guys are doing this, the parent company will file a GST return and try to claim those GST ITCs back. Um, and again, as many of you know, the series is denying quite a bit of these. So. When it comes down to, as you can imagine, when the CRA is ha when CRA has a difference, uh, when CRA and the taxpayer have a difference of opinion, oftentimes the decision, the the appeal will go to the Tax Court of Canada. Um, so just to kind of give you as an idea of, of the way it works is, uh, you know, if you file your GST return, you know, you usually go through the audit process with CRA. You know, oftentimes you get nowhere there. The CRA will deny the ITCs. Then you'll appeal. Um, that decision to the appeals division of the CRA and again if that if you're not successful at that stage you'll then basically go to the tax court of Canada if the ITCs are usually uh, of significant amount. So in the past um, there's been a couple of court cases and one of the uh, the main ones is the Stantec court case uh, which occurred in 2008 um, and um, this has obviously been changing. Uh, I can tell you over the last year, a lot of our clients have actually been going to the Tax Court of Canada to appeal their, their case um, because the dollar amounts are quite significant. And some of them can range from their $200,000 to $300,000 in ITCs alone. So quite significant. So to get, give you guys a little background on the Stantec court case that happened in 2008, because uh, this is a, a really important uh, case in, in the GST world, um, what ended up happening, and I'll, I'll kind of switch to the, to the next slide um, so you guys get an idea. Stantec Canada um, was a Canadian company, and it wanted to actually acquire the shares of Keith Industries, which you can see is at the bottom. What it had to do is it had to incorporate uh, Stantec California, which is obviously a U.S. company, um, in order to basically acquire Keith Industries and, and Keith Industries and Stantec California eventually merged. Um, and, and in that process, Stantec Canada actually had to list itself on the New York Stock Exchange to appeal to the shareholders of Keith Industries. And by doing that, Stantec Canada actually incurred a significant amount of professional fees, uh, including about $59,000 of GST that it tried to claim back. So. It obviously tried to claim the ITCs, it was denied at the audit and the appeal stage, and then they went to uh, the Tax Court of Canada. Uh, the, the CRA, again, consistent with what they've been always preaching in their bulletin, uh, they said that there needs to be a direct connection between the expenses incurred by the holding company and the underlying subsidiary. Um, the taxpayer said, no, that's not what the legislation says. It simply says it needs to be in relation to uh, the underlying subsidiary shares or the loan. In this particular case, the court actually sided with the taxpayer and they said, yeah, the, the taxpayer is right. Um, the, the legislation doesn't say there needs to be a direct connection. It just simply says it needs to be in relation to uh, the underlying subsidiary shares. And they allowed it. And it actually went uh, to the next level of the Federal, federal court, of, court of Appeal. And the taxpayer was still successful at that level. So. That's the decision, and, and I should kind of mention, which is really important for the Stantec court case, uh, 
Uh, this was actually held under the informal procedure at the Tax Court of Canada level. And as many of you know, the, the informal procedure decisions are not binding on the CRA. So every time I'm speaking to the CRA, whether it's at the audit level or the appeals level, and I use the Stantec court case, they always refute it and they say it's not binding on us. And they just simply ignore um, this decision, unfortunately. So fast forward to 2015, and, we, and, and the taxpayers got a great court case called Mitzi Copper Corporation. Um, it was a decision in 2000, uh, sorry, February 2015. Uh, again, it was held under the informal procedure. Uh, but Mitzi uh, was a very similar situation to Stantex. Uh, Mitzi had uh, shares in a Luxembourg corporation. And that Luxembourg corporation then had shares in Polish uh, corporations. And those Polish corporations were in mineral exploration. Uh, Mitzi was a, a Vancouver-based Canadian company. And so what Mitzi was doing is it was getting money from the public through the, you know, the TSX, I think it was, um, loaning the money down to Luxembourg, and then Luxembourg was then using that money down in its Polish subsidiaries. Again, Mitzi incurred obviously a significant amount of professional fees, legal and accounting. It also had management fees. Uh, it paid for consulting to consultants. Um, obviously went to the appeal stage uh, with the CRA, got denied, they appealed to the Tax Court of Canada. And in this particular case, the taxpayer again was successful. And ironically, um, even though the Stantec court case is not binding on the CRA, the judge in the Mitzi Copper Corporation case actually referenced the Stantec judge's comments and said, hey, this is what Stan the Stantec judge said. And actually, I'm in agreement with them, and the, the taxpayer should actually be eligible to claim these ITCs. So it, it just kind of reaffirmed the fact that you know uh, the in, the legislation should be interpreted quite broadly, and the CRA um, has quite a narrow scope um, of their interpretation. So uh, just kind of going back to that, um, you know, moving forward, uh, I I think uh, you know. Again, this forces this Mitzi Copper Corporation case, and, and I've talked to some of our clients, and they said, "Well, this is really an informal procedure decision. Is this going to help us?" Um, to be honest, it does because it just adds more bullets to the chamber in terms of uh, peppering the CR with more court cases that are in the taxpayers' uh, favor. Um, and luckily, what we've actually been seeing is the Department of Justice has actually been caving on a lot of our clients' uh, uh, cases um, at the tax court. At, at the Tax Court of Canada level. So uh, oftentimes what happens is when the CRA doesn't want a decision to be rendered and to be open to the public, they'll obviously settle it before then. Um, and we actually have a number of our clients that act, have actually received their ITCs at the tax court level before the decision has been rendered. So, you know, moving forward, I think if any of you guys are in this situation, just, just stay the course. Um, that would be our recommendation. It looks like things are looking up. I've spoken to a lot of the lawyers around the city that are dealing with the Tax Court of Canada with this particular situation, and they're all uh, in favor and they're, they're all optimistic that things are going to turn around and the CRA will eventually have to change their uh, position on this matter.